The homeless man in the brown overcoat chewed on his dirty thumb, staring off into the mist and dirty rain. He told me his name was Angel. I stood next to this penniless vagrant with rapt attention. A man in a thousand dollar suit and more money than I knew what to do with. I listened to every word he said, writing some of it down. Huh. You have to understand, Angel said, his hazel eyes rolling wildly as he stared past me at things only he could see. NASA is run by the reptilian overlords. They are a demonic agency with the power to kill people. Anyone who has real, solid evidence that shows the moon landing was faked gets murdered or dies under suspicious circumstances. NASA even killed Michael Jackson, and do you know why? I shook my head, a notebook perched into one hand and a solid gold fountain pen in the other. Angel leaned in close, as if he was about to whisper a great secret. Because Michael Jackson's moonwalk became more famous than NASA's moonwalk. I looked up surprised. A thin smile placed across the corners of my lips. Angel's expression stayed grave. A fit of laughter ripped its way out of my stomach. What? No way, I said, still chuckling loudly. But Angel only nodded firmly. NASA got jealous and decided that he had to go. They poisoned him, man. NASA has lots of hitman on their payroll. They always get their target. I continued jotting down notes, trying to collect as much information as I could. NASA killed Michael Jackson because they were jealous his moonwalk was better than theirs? I quickly scrawled in cursive across the expensive white paper. If you had told me a few days ago that I would spend many hours of my time roving around while listening to crazy drunk addicts, and rambling homeless people speaking about conspiracy theories, I would have laughed. That is, until I moved me and my daughter into Disney's brand new secret town and learned that not all conspiracy theories are fake. If I had listened to the first rumblings of bizarre rumors about the secret Disney town that they were building in Florida and stayed far away, I wouldn't wake up screaming every night. I told my neighbor about it the day before the movie. A shirtless man with a bulging beer belly and a black carpet of hair across his chest who went around telling everyone his name was J-Spot Jeffrey. Well, my 10-year-old daughter loves Disney stuff. I explained as he nodded vacantly, drinking down an entire can of light beer in a single long swallow before belching. And, you know... Her mom died last year. Oh, I was so sorry to hear about that, Jeffrey said, putting out a flat hand across the low metal fence slung across our yards and patting me hard on the shoulder. You never know when it's your time, eh? One day you could just be driving down the highway and... Yeah, it was horrible, I said, cutting him off. I remember the night I had gotten the call telling me a tractor trailer had hit my wife's car. When I saw pictures of the vehicle later, it looked like little more than a twisted framework of blackened steel. Everything around this house reminded me of her. It made my heart ache with regrets and loneliness. The town's not too far away, eh? You think I could come visit you once you get settled in? Jeffrey asked. I looked at him in surprise. Why would you want to do that? I asked. I've heard a lot of urban legends about Disney. Not just how Walt Disney's head is cryogenically frozen, but a lot of creepier rumors too. I just like to look around and see it. What do they call the new town? He asked. Storyland, I said. The town of Storyland. A few days later, 
my daughter Casey and I were driving down the private road towards Storyland. A metal gate finally embosed into silver images of Mickey Mouse and the Cinderella Castle loomed 20 feet in the air. A guard dressed in all black came out, taking my license and looking closely at it before allowing the gates to split open down the middle. Dozens of cameras peered down with their opaque, lidless eyes, seeing everything but understanding nothing. Every time our family visited Disney, I felt a sense of awe at seeing how much land they owned. Casey stared impassively out the window at the thick Florida swampland, her green eyes the color of ivy. She wrinkled her nose as a fetid, rank odor snuck in through the air conditioning and vents. It smells like swamp water here, she complained, putting her long sleeve up to her nose while breathing in through the fabric. I rolled down the windows a crack to try to let the fresh air steam in through the car, but it just made the smell worse. That's because there is a swamp here, I said. It does smell pretty bad, huh? What if the whole town smells bad, Daddy? She asked. I don't want to live in a place that smells like that, even if Mickey does live there. She seemed to think on it for a long moment. Okay, maybe if both Mickey and Elsa live there, I'll be okay with it. I gave her a faint half smile, tuning her out as she started to ramble about what kind of house Mickey Mouse would live in. It took us nearly 20 minutes from when we had passed through the gate to reach the first buildings of Storyland. The palm trees, thick vines, and green, swampy water started to give way to perfectly manicured lawns. Welcome to Storyland. A cheerful sign read far ahead of us, curving over the road in silver letters five feet tall. Giant Disney characters filled with helium loomed over the street, grinning down at us in their frozen plastic expressions. Mickey and Minnie floated next to Elsa, Bella, and Simba. They all had their gigantic inflatable hands up in greeting. Some hidden mechanism inside the floating characters caused their arms to wave, moving back and forth in slow, lazy arcs. So cool, Casey said excitedly, leaning over in her seat and hugging me. Her little arms wrapped around my neck as she kissed me on the cheek. Thanks, Daddy. This place is the best. It doesn't smell like a swamp in here anymore, I remarked as we stopped in front of the enormous gleaming sign. Two thick metal gates blocked the road. Tiny black half-spears of hidden cameras blinked their red eyes in a rhythmic procession. After a few moments, the gates started sliding apart on their own. It all appeared to be fully automated. We pulled through, coming to a town that reeked of excess and money. Casey nodded happily to herself floating along on cloud nine as expensive mansions and castles loomed above us on both sides of the street. Her auburn hair had strawberry blonde streaks running through it. She opened her window and stuck her head outside like a dog, letting her long hair blow behind her in the wind. Some of the castles appeared to be four or five stories high, with giant glass windows cut into the hard gray stone. A few even had narrow moats of clear, fresh water cut into the enormous lawns. Palm trees lined the yards of Victorian houses, their thin turrets reaching up into the sky like grasping fingers. Ferraris, Porsches, Lamborghinis, and other luxury cars shone in the driveways, their sleek bodies emanating power and respect. And yet, I didn't see anyone out in the yards. I found that odd. The GPS didn't work out here. Once we got off the public roads and onto Disney's private land, it acted as if we had driven straight into the middle of the forest. 
When I bought the property at Storyland, they had sent me a map and a letter stating they would begin setting up cell phone towers in the area within days. Digging through the middle console, I pulled out the folded map, squinting down at it as I pulled over to the side of the road. We live at 777 Celebration Road, I said, frowning at the convoluted spiderwebs of streets that span the map in front of me. And we're on the road leading in. Looks like it's called Main Street USA. So if we take Main Street USA to... Casey gave a slow, strangled squeak, the sound of a rabbit getting its neck snapped. It immediately snapped me out of my reverie. I looked up suddenly, seeing her staring out the passenger side window, her mouth agape. A child stood on the sidewalk with blood coming from the dark gapping holes in her eye sockets. He held his hands against his pale white cheeks. His mouth hung open in a silent scream, the many gaps in his tiny milk teeth showing through his pale lips. I'm stuck! He gurgled, blood pouring from his throat. I'm stuck in this place! Help me! He looked straight up at the sky, and I saw his throat had been slashed from ear to ear. The flesh separated as crimson waterfalls flowed down the front of his chest. Casey inhaled deeply, like a drowning person coming up for the briefest moment to air. Then, with lungs like a forged bellows, she screamed, an ear-splitting high-pitched shriek of absolute terror. I jumped to action, putting the car into drive and peeling away from the walking corpse on the sidewalk. When I looked back, the boy had disappeared, but a few drops of bright flesh blood still glistened brightly under the sharp rays of the Florida sun. What was wrong with that boy? Casey cried, tears streaming down her small pinched face. Her red eyes turned to me, searching for answers, but I couldn't give her any. I pressed the gas hard revving the engine and glancing down at the map. Main Street USA led to Frozen Lane and finally to Celebration Road. That must have been a joke, trying to justify it to myself and to Casey. Hollywood makeup and fake blood. If that boy really had his throat cut like that, he wouldn't be standing and breathing. Casey's tears slowed as she blinked a few times, absorbing the statement. That's not a nice joke, she said, crossing her arms in front of her fluorescent blue shirt. If it was a joke, that boy is a poophead. I nodded. The homes on Celebration Road were not so extravagant as the castles and Victorian mansions spanning Main Street, USA. They all had perfectly manicured lawns, in-ground pools in the shape of classic Disney characters and beautiful wraparound porches and massive bay windows, however. The house I had rented for a year after only seeing pictures of it came up quickly on our left. It was painted bright red, a three-story colonial with porches on every story and circular windows like glass monocles reflecting the tropical sunshine. We got out of the car, walking up the cobbled stone walkway towards the front door. A silver knocker with the beast's face on it stared back at us. Underneath the knocker, I saw a printed note with a looping signature scrawled underneath it. I ripped it off, reading the note aloud as Casey played with the knocker. No drugs, alcohol, or tobacco products are allowed in Storyland due to the risk of interactions. Free samples of Mouse Z are given to all households, however. Mouse Z is a totally non-addictive, non-toxic dietary supplement that will enhance your enjoyment while in Storyland. All guests and citizens of Storyland consent to exposure of Mouse Z throughout their food, water, air, or exposure to surfaces. Enjoy your stay, and thanks again from the Disney Company.
I scratched my head, reading the note again. What the hell was Mouse Z? It didn't sound like any dietary supplement I had ever heard of. I scowled, squinting at the signature, trying to make out the letters at the bottom. Mr. Crowley. It sounded like a made-up name. I crumpled up the note, unlocking the door. The cool, air-conditioned breeze blew past us with the smell of flowers and fresh paint. I saw vibrant plants scattered around the entrance room. Couches as white as virgin snow sat against the walls, each emblazoned with the black silhouette of the Cinderella Castle and the Disney logo. A landline rang in the living room just as I had walked past. My heart jumped in my throat when the shrill ringing pierced the silence, but I quickly calmed down when I realized it was just the phone. Hello? I said as soon as I picked up the receiver. This is the guard at the front gate. You have a visitor named Jeffrey Stein, the man said in a flat tone. I sighed, looking down at my watch. That was quick. Jeffrey must have been really hot to see this weird little town. Yeah, send him through, I said, hanging up the phone. Casey had gone ahead into the kitchen, and I quickly followed behind her. I'm so thirsty, I said, cutting through the living room with its enormous flat screen TV and comfortable sectionals. The kitchen had all brand new appliances, and the fridge was stocked with food, soda, juices, and milk. I grabbed two sprites, giving one to Casey, who opened it gratefully. I cracked mine open and chugged it all in a few huge gulps. It tasted slightly strange, almost like the bitter aftertaste of caffeine. Casey wrinkled her tiny button nose. This soda tastes old, she complained. I tried looking at the expiration date, but everything suddenly seemed blurry. I blinked quickly. My eyes teared up. I felt very weird, dissociated and floating. The world flickered like a shimmering mirage. The dull colors and faded texture of reality throbbed like the cobwebs of a nightmarish fever dream. My vision started to ripple and morph within seconds. I looked down at Casey, but where my daughter had been standing, I now saw a nightmarish creature with giant glassy black eyes. I stepped back, crying out. What's wrong, Daddy? The demonic figure hissed in a deep, gurgling voice, with red skin stretching thin over its bony head and black talons on its hands. It looked like it stepped straight out of hell. It opened its mouth, revealing needle-sharp teeth growing out of its oozing gums like hundreds of tumors. Two enormous pointed mouse ears were surgically attached to its shiny skin. Black stitches stuck out like pieces of barbed wire at the base of the rotted brown ears. Dried crusts of orange pus clung to the sides of its head, like the decomposing riverbeds of some ancient disease tributary. What's going on? What? Get back! I cried, putting my hands up. The thing just laughed, gnashing its torn slash of a mouth as its lidless black eyes gleamed with sadistic glee. This world is our creation for your kind. There are many surprises in Storyland for the sons and daughters of Adam. I am Mr. Crawley, and I will be your guide. Come and see. He said, running forwards and lunging for my throat with its twisted jungle of cancerous fangs. I spun around, fleeing through the morphine door with thousands of teeth that appeared in front of me. The sides of the door flexed and shivered like the lips of some alien predator. With a wet, sloshing sound, the door started to close around me, the enormous fangs drawing nearer. I lunged through it, 
landing hard on black, spongy earth. I raised my head and beheld an amazing sight. An extraterrestrial landscape stretched out of the horizon with writhing, snake-like jungle vines dancing across the surface. Castles thousands of stories high loomed far off in the distance like giant mountains, their sharp turrets piercing the crimson clouds and disappearing from view. Spinning black holes sent out great jets of light and planetary rings like those of Saturn shone through the narrow breaks in the blood-red clouds that covered the skies like tumors. Thick patches of shimmering silver fog swept across the landscape, obscuring entire swaths of the eldritch jungle. A plume of fluffy, luminescent fog a few dozen feet away disappeared like a breath of smoke as a humid jungle breeze blew past. The insane creature with the mouse ears surgically attached to its demonic naked body stood in the midst of it, his black eyes glittering with insanity as he stared straight at me. This is my world. He said as silver saliva dripped from his grinning mouth. Do you think that you could run from me? I am everywhere, in the wind, in the trees, and even in you. I am Mr. Crowley, and I know who you are. Your daughter is here with us, too. I shook my head, closing my eyes. This is all some hallucination, I said, trying to reassure myself. I bet this place isn't even owned by Disney. It's probably some frickin' CIA black site where they experiment on people with new drugs. Mr. Crawley laughed at that. This world is the rock which the builders rejected which had become the cornerstone of all things. We have made it so. You will not leave until we allow it. We could make every moment of your time stretch out to a million years. By the time eternity passed, the only thing that would return to your body would be the insane empty shell of a mind. Mr. Crawley hissed, his blank obsidian eyes gleaming with a childlike cruelty. What do you want from me? I whispered. Only this. The creature gurgled as the bloody clouds above us whipped and soared in cyclonical whirls like the currents of a hurricane. You must call more people into Storyland, many more. If you bring others to this world, the cornerstone of all realities, we will let you and the girl leave in peace. His voice in the world began to blow away like smoke in a strong breeze. Everything grew faint and distant. But if not, we will follow you, and then, only the death of the universe many eternities from now would bring you any release from the endless suffering of Storyland. I groaned, feeling blood running down my face. I opened my eyes. Sharp stabbing pains emanated from various spots all over my body. Hey buddy! Jeffrey said, leaning low over me and slightly slapping my face. What the hell is going on here? I looked around, seeing that I had ran straight through the sliding door in the back of the house at Storyland. I was lying surrounded by twinkling shards of glass on the concrete patio. To my amusement, I saw Jeffrey had a shirt on for the first time for as long as I had known him. The white fabric of the t-shirt was stretched thin across his bulging, fat stomach. Ugh, oh, God, my head, I said, bringing my hand up to my forehead. My fingers came away wet with blood. I had the craziest damn dream, Jeffrey. We got here, and there was a bizarre note on the door saying that all the food and drinks and stuff were laced with some weird drug, and then I drank a can of soda and... I trailed off, my heart suddenly speeding up in my chest. Where's Casey, Jeffrey? He shook his head, dumbfounded. I just got here and heard the door shattering back there. I circled around your yard and found you here like this. I have no idea where the girl is. 
he said, looking around with concern. He had the look of a man who had accidentally walked into a lunatic's asylum filled with dangerous inmates. Don't drink or eat anything here, Jeffrey, I said, raving. Don't wash your hands. Don't touch the water or anything. I don't know what's going on here, but it's not normal. There's something unnatural. That was really the core of it. The entire experience with Mouse Z had seemed like something real, not like the creeping delusions of a drug trip. Jeffrey gave me a confused look, taking a step back from me. I think I should probably call an ambulance, he said, not meeting my eyes. You may have had a concussion, bud. Just calm down, okay? I don't think anyone's drugging this entire town. That sounds like something from a bad sci-fi movie. Come on, James. Think about it. Help me up, I said, putting out my hand. Jeffrey pulled me up. My head swam as black motes danced across my vision. As I tried steadying myself, leaning heavily on Jeffrey's thick shoulder, I felt the world spinning around me. We need to find Casey. Okay, bud. Easy does it, he said, putting a meaty arm around me. We opened the shattered sliding door. The sparkling shards of glass crunched under our feet like dead leaves. I felt a small amount of strength returning to me as I staggered forward, wheezing like an asthmatic. Half-dried blood caked my arms and fresh drops still ran down the cut from my forehead. See, there's Casey right there, Jeffrey said reassuringly, pointing to the couch in the living room. I glanced over hopefully, but my heart dropped when I saw what was lying on the couch. It was about the size of my daughter, but it looked like the nightmarish results of some mad scientist with a death camp full of patience and unlimited money. I saw the face of my daughter there and even recognized her fluorescent blue t-shirt. But something was terribly wrong with her now. The half-human, half-mouse abomination on the couch looked up at us with eyes full of agony. The jellied whites of her eyes glistened like pools of pus. Bright rivulets of blood dribbled down the soft white hairs covering her face. Her legs were twisted, broken sticks that had the same pink fleshy hue at the mouse's paws. Blood bubbled from her shivering lips. Garish black stitches ran up and down her body in irregular squared patches. The ears of some enormous genetically engineered mouse had been sewn on top of her hairless mutilated skull. A rainbow of liquids dripped from the surgical sites, dripping in sickly infected oranges and clotted dark reds. Broken bones stuck outwards through the skin of her arms and legs like daggers stabbing through a corpse. God, what happened? Is that really you, Casey? I said, ripping myself away from Jeffrey and stumbling across the room. Kill me. She whispered as pink, fetid drool dribbled out of her slashed mouth. It hurts, Daddy. Please, kill me. I heard a gurgling laugh from behind me. I turned my head, seeing Mr. Crawley standing in the place of Jeffrey. Behind him, the red sky of that other world shone through the shattering sliding door into our house at Storyland. Do you think you could escape that easily? If you do not bring me new tributes, I will draw every drop of agony from you and your daughter that the human mind can experiment. I will draw every drop of agony from you and your daughter that the human mind can experience. And when you are destroyed, trembling, insane wretches, only then will I allow you to die, slowly and painfully. So do you agree to the terms? Will you bring us new tributes? Never. I'd rather die than bring other people into this nightmare. The twisted body of Casey on the couch continued gurgling and spitting up frothy blood. Mr. Crowley's face changed into an expression of pleasure at the challenge. 
We do love a fighter here at Storyland, he said, grinning widely, showing off the hundreds of needle-like fangs that poked out of his mouth like the quills of a porcupine. He snapped his long, tapered fingers together. His talons flashed and threw off sparks of white light. The red alien sky behind Mr. Crowley seemed to swirl and bubble faster. Perhaps some of our pets here can help you change your mind. His black lidless eyes spun in their sockets as he glanced back through the shattered door into the alien jungles beyond. I watched in horror as two creatures from a nightmare came loping out of the thick vines and dancing brush. This is the beast and Simba, Mr. Crowley said his shrill laughter ripping through the air like the rending of metal. And I saw in front a half-human, half-animal combination with long flowing black hair all over its body. Its powerful leg and arm muscles pistoned like machines as they loped gracefully through the door. Its eyes gleamed pure white like spoiled milk. It gnashed its massive jaws together, sending out long streams of drool that flung out behind it. Next to the beast, a hairless lion with surgical marks all over its body limped quickly forward. It had an extra eye surgically inserted into its forehead, and each of its legs had extra paws sewn on its back. The lion's three eyes glistened with bloodlust and hunger. Their heavy bodies shook the floor as they sped towards me and my daughter. I turned to the mutilated body of Casey on the couch. She had seen death coming towards her in this new hellish form and now fell with a thud to the ground in the attempt to escape it. She tried crawling away. I ran towards her as a heavy weight came down on my back. I spun around to see the mouth of the lion opening inches away from my face. A deep throaty growl emanated from its chest. It brought its paws down onto my chest and I felt my ribs snap like twigs. They shattered with the sound like ice cracking. Behind me, Casey gave a strangled shriek of agony as the beast tore into her with its powerful jaws. The sounds of our screams echoed across the room. I felt my vocal cords tear as blood spurted from my mouth. The pain seemed to go on and on as the jaws came down again and again, ripping off pieces of my body. Eventually, once I was nearly dead, Mr. Crawley came over, peering down at me with his glistening beetle eyes. Will you bring me new tributes, or do we need to repeat this for the next trillion years? He asked in a cold, psychopathic tone. I nodded my bloody head, spinning out broken teeth and frothy blood. I'll do it! I groaned weakly, feeling most of the bones in my body shattered. Every breath felt like I was inhaling acid. I looked down, seeing parts of my arms and legs torn off my intestines peeking through the torn mass of flesh around my stomach like a coiled snake looking out of its den. Mr. Crawley grinned, nodding to the animals. The lion knelt down, and with a powerful crunch of its jaws, it ripped my throat out. The world quickly went black as endless pain reverberated through my cautiousness and cold death overtook me. Slowly, languidly, I opened my eyes and found myself on the kitchen floor. Casey was lying next to me, her pupils dilated and mouth open. Drool puddled on the linoleum beneath her catatonic face. Casey? I said weakly, pushing myself up. My entire body felt sore, as if I had felt reflections of that new death sensation that had just ripped across my mind like moments earlier. I wanted to grab Casey and get out of there, but I couldn't trust my own mind anymore. I knew that if I didn't do what Mr. Crawley wanted, I would keep getting stuck in this nightmarish world. It was like an eternity of false awakenings, 
a type of hell I had never imagined in my wildest nightmare. I don't know if this one would prove to be the same. Without hesitation, I picked up my uncautious daughter and brought her to the car. Jeffrey pulled up with his middle-aged girlfriend moments later. They gawked at us with open mouths. Hey, just go inside and get some drinks, I yelled at them. I just have to go up to the gatehouse for a few minutes. Have a seat, look around, make yourselves comfortable. Jeffrey nodded and gave me a thumbs up. I peeled out of there. Casey awoke as we drove the long trek back towards the guardhouse. Once we were a few minutes away, my cell phone started ringing again, and I realized I had service. I pulled up slowly to the metal gate, looking out at the guard in his sleek uniform. He peeked out through the guardhouse, but the shape didn't look human. With a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach, I glimpsed a dark silhouette with mouse ears and black eyes. The figure quickly disappeared back behind the door. Shaking, I looked down at my phone. I sent a mass text message to all my friends. I just rented a house in an exclusive Disney town. My address is at 777 Celebration Road, Storyland. Unlimited free drinks and food here. Feel free to let yourselves in and stay as long as you want. Make yourselves at home and explore the town. I will not be at the house, however. Just tell the guard that you know me. As soon as I pressed send, the gate started to swing to the side, and I left that den of horrors. I glanced back and saw two obsidian eyes and the grinning slash of a mouth peering out of the guardhouse. I shuddered. I finished telling my story to Angel, who nodded unsurprised. The homeless lunatic knew all about conspiracy theories. He had told me about Walt Disney's frozen head, the ghosts at Disney, and all the suspicious deaths covered up there. I'm not surprised that they're working with the CIA now and some weird mind control drug, Angel said, his eyes gleaming darkly in the streetlights. It is, after all, their world. I backed up, a cold shiver running through my spine as those words rang out around me again. They were words I hadn't heard since the horrors of Storyland. In the darkness of the alleyway, I thought I saw the silhouette of mouse ears on Angel's head and teeth growing out of his gums like tumors. I blinked, and he was just a normal vagrant again. I hope this isn't the world of Storyland, I said, a sense of desperation clenching my heart. Sometimes, I wonder if I ever left it. I wonder if Casey and I are still there, waiting for the next round of torture. Angel only grinned, his lips spreading wide. And in the shadows of the alley, his teeth jutted out like hundreds of needles.